My name is Katrina Lekertz, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about a system called Cicada, which we designed to provide predictive guarantees for cloud networks. And this is joint work with my colleagues at Google, MIT, and HP Labs. So this is a talk about bandwidth guarantees for cloud networks. So what do I mean by that? Typically, we have a customer who shows up and requests some number of virtual machines in the cloud. The provider will then you know, allocate these VMs across the cloud, and the customer will start running his application. So informally, a bandwidth guarantee is just a promise from the provider to the customer that the customer's VMs will be able to communicate with each other at a particular rate. So there are a lot of details that I've left out here and a lot of things we'll talk about throughout this talk, but I'd like to start off with a more basic question, which is just why do this in the first place? Right? Why should providers offer such a, a system? And this is a totally reasonable question because you know you might think, well, is there actually that much data going through these networks that we need guarantees? And so I probably don't need to convince you all of this, but yeah, applications these days are sending terabytes, petabytes of data. So you can think of large MapReduce deployments, scientific computing applications, these types of things. You know, but okay, cloud networks are typically homogenous and pretty well provisioned. So do we really need network guarantees? Well, remember that the scenario that I have here on the screen is really never happening. There's actually quite a lot of users of these networks. So a single customer's traffic is definitely going to get affected by other users. So these networks can get crowded and congested. So, but fine, you know, are there really customers that care so much about their network performance that they need a guarantee on it? So in this talk, what I'm really thinking about is enterprise customers. And these are customers that needed to satisfy their own server level agreements with their own customers. And they can be driven away from today's public cloud networks since those networks don't provide them with any guarantees. Okay, so given that we're going to do this, let's look at how that might work. So here's one possible architecture. This is just a straw man architecture for providing guarantees. So we have a customer who shows up, and in the straw man, my customer is not only gonna request the number of VMs that he needs, but also the guarantee. Okay, and so then the provider will go ahead, place the VMs, and enforce this guarantee. And the right side of this architecture has all sorts of technical issues that we would need to address. But I actually want to talk more about the left-hand side, and in particular about the burden that we've placed on the customer with this architecture. So this customer had to show up knowing the guarantee that they were going to request. So what if they were wrong, right? In this example, what if some pairs of this customer's VMs actually use fewer than 10 gigabits per second? Well, in that case, we would have an over-provisioned network if the customer is paying for internal bandwidth, that's gonna increase the cost, and it's just going to waste bandwidth within the network. So that's not so great. On the flip side, what if some pairs of VMs actually needed more than 10 gigabits per second? Well, now we have this under-provisioned network, so the customer's application is going to perform poorly. So this is a real problem, right? How is this customer supposed to show up and know what guarantee they need? Okay, this is where Cicada comes in. Cicada gets around this problem by making predictions about an application's traffic and automatically generating a guarantee for the customer. So in Cicada, the customer shows up and makes an initial request for machines, just like they would today. The provider will go ahead and place those VMs, and then as the application starts to run, hypervisors will send measurements to the Cicada controller. These measurements tell us things about where traffic is moving within the application, so how many bytes the different pairs of virtual machines are sending. Okay, and then Cicada is going to use those measurements to actually predict bandwidth for each tenant. And the provider can then offer a guarantee based on that prediction. It can actually do one other cool thing. Uh, it can actually update the placement of the VMs with these predictions as well. So, most of my talk today is going to focus on these three components. I'm gonna talk a lot about how Cicada makes its predictions, how the provider uses those to offer guarantees, and a little bit about how placement works. So, you all should be wondering at this point, is application traffic actually predictable, right? Can we even do this? Uh, if we can, is it already captured by existing models? Do we need something new? You know, how does this work? So let's start off by looking at some existing models of application traffic, all right? And the way I'm gonna illustrate this is just with a traffic matrix. So each cell here should represent the amount of data uh, that an application is, is going to send. So here's one example, and this is similar to a model that appeared in SICOM a few years ago, not exactly the same. You can see here that we have clusters of VMs. Within a cluster, a lot of data is being transferred. Across clusters, not so much. This traffic matrix is a bit of a lie, right? VMs aren't communicating with themselves, so the entries on the diagonal will be zero. 
This is a fairly rigid model. You can imagine that if we wanted to predict something about applications that fit this model, Cicada would need to predict, you know, the amount of bandwidth within a cluster, across clusters, maybe what the clusters are. But when we started designing the system and thinking about how we would do prediction, we first wanted to see, do applications actually fit these existing models? And we had a sense that some applications might not. That in fact, we might see applications that looked more like this. Okay, you can see this application on the right side is a lot more variable. There are a lot more options for the amount of data that pairs can, tra can transfer. And we say that there is more spatial variability here. Okay, and you can kind of, you could move this matrix all around, but it doesn't, it doesn't really fit the picture on the left. Um, similarly, we thought that these application matrices might change over time. Okay, so maybe one hour our traffic looks like this, but in the next hour we do something like this, so on. So we felt that there might be some temporal variability in these applications. But of course we didn't know, okay, so before we developed any sort of system, we collected some data. So from HP Cloud Services, we observed uh, S-flow data on their top of rack switches. And what that gives us for this talk is one traffic matrix per hour for every application. And these traffic matrices, within them, each entry represents the number of bytes sent between two virtual machines. Um, if you're interested in more fine-grained time sales, you can see the paper in the, the tech report for results on that. But for this talk, everything is gonna be in epics of one hour. So our goal right now is to use this data set to quantify spatial and temporal variability because we want to see, you know, what, what are these applications doing? So I'll talk briefly about spatial variability and how we quantify that. And to do this, I'm going to give you three examples. These aren't meant to be precise. This is just kind of an intuitive thing. So you can see this application on the left has no spatial variability. Everyone's sending the same amount of data. In the middle, we have some. There's kind of two, two values for bandwidth. And then we have higher spatial variability on the right. So we'd like a number to give us that. And so this is what we do. We look at this quantity F, where Fij is the fraction of tenant traffic sent from VMI to VMJ. So in the first example, all of the F values are equal. Uh, in the second example, there are two distinct F values. And then on the right, there are many more. And I haven't given precise numbers, so we don't know exactly what they are, but there's a lot of them. And then to calculate spatial variability, well, this follows kind of naturally. We're gonna look at the coefficient of variation of these F values, which is just the standard deviation divided by the mean. So on the left, that coefficient of variation is zero. In the middle, you can do some math, you'll find out that it's one. And on the right, it's greater than one. Okay, so in general, the higher this value, the higher the spatial variation. So we did this for the applications in our data set. We calculated this quantity for all of them. And this is what we got. So what you see here is that applications are exhibiting high spatial variability, right? Most of these values are greater than one. Some of them are as large as 100. I won't have time today to show you space temporal variability, but we quantify it in a very similar way and we see the same result. And we also saw high temporal variability. So for us, we thought that customers today probably aren't going to model this much variability themselves. And this was enough motivation for us to want to build some more general prediction method that didn't make any assumptions about the structure of the application beforehand. Okay, so that's exactly what we did. So how does that work? Well, again, we're starting with these observed traffic matrices and we're trying to make a prediction for the next hour. What's it gonna look like? So certainly the prediction is going to be some function of the past, right? So the question is what function? Well, we started by using a linear combination, so each of the previous matrices gets a weight. One way to think about this is the higher the weight, the more influential that matrix is on the prediction. So I haven't answered any questions yet, right, because now you should all be asking, well, how do you set the weights? So Cicada does kind of a cool thing, which is that instead of setting them beforehand, it actually learns them online. This is cool because it means that Cicada can actually update its weights with every prediction. Okay, so if it does, makes a prediction and it turns out to be bad, it can adjust the function that it's using for that application. So my notation here is a bit of a lie, right? These weights are a function of time. So now, how do we update the weights? Well, we start by taking whatever the weight was in the previous round, and then we multiply it by this loss function, and that's what allows us to correct for errors. And then we just go ahead and normalize the weights, okay? So this is Cicada's prediction algorithm. It's fairly simple, uh, but you'll note that it doesn't make any assumptions on what the application structure is. And so what I want to convince you of in the rest of this talk is that this type of prediction is possible and worth doing. That you don't have to make assumptions about structure and you can still do some cool things. What I am not trying to convince you of is that I have developed the optimal best traffic prediction algorithm ever in the entire world, okay? 
But so let's see how it works. So the first evaluation that I'm going to look at is just how accurate these predictions are. This evaluation is actually in our, our tech report. And so we compared its predictions to ones made by a system inspired by VOC. So that's in, similar to these rigid applications. Okay, now that paper actually requires customers to input parameters themselves. Um, for this talk, I'm going to look at using an Oracle method where we pick the best possible parameters for the system. Uh, we also allowed it to vary over time to get a kind of a more fair comparison between the two systems. And we're gonna look at two types of error, which is L2 norm error and relative error. The reason I wanna look at two different types of errors is because relative error differentiates between over and under prediction. And we're actually really interested in under prediction. We would like Cicada to not under predict very often because that's going to decrease performance for the customer. Um, but relative error has the problem that sometimes over and under prediction errors can cancel out. And so L2 norm error does not have that problem. Okay, so these are the results. This is for predicting average demand, which means that we're going to predict the total amount of bandwidth that each pair is going to need in the next hour, the total amount of bytes that they'll predict. All right, and so what you can see from these graphs is that SCADIS predictions are doing pretty well. Okay, they're outperforming predictions of this other system, and moreover, they don't require any customer input. So this is good to see. Uh, one downside is that Cicada does occasionally underpredict, and as I said in the previous slide, that is something we would like to avoid. Um, here, VOC never underpredicts because we chose its parameters to avoid that. Um, but we would like to see the, this left tail decrease a little bit. Uh, the final thing I want to mention on this slide, is, which isn't apparent from the graphs, is that Cicada's predictions actually require very little application history. So we typically only need a couple of hours um, before we can start making accurate predictions. So it's not the case that your cloud applications need to be running for days or weeks before you can use Cicada. Uh, it actually starts to work very quickly, though the more history we have, the better in general. So now that we've looked at the accuracy of these predictions, let's talk about how they get turned into guarantees. Um, if you're familiar with kind of the world of, of guarantees, you might recognize that these are gonna be what are known as pipe model guarantees. This is a separate guarantee for each source destination pair. Uh, and the guarantee for a particular pair will be exactly the same as its prediction with some caveats. So first of all, in the system network, resources have to be available. Right? If the network is totally hosed, the provider isn't going to make a guarantee for that customer. And there are a lot of existing systems out there to deal with this problem. Uh, a second point I'd like to make is that customers can add a buffer to the offer guarantees that they'd like. So they can accept guarantees, but if they, Cicada's guarantees, but if they really want to make sure it doesn't underpredict, they can request a bit more bandwidth. Um, providers can also choose to augment predictions that Cicada isn't confident about. So when Cicada makes a prediction, it has some notion of how accurate it expects it to be. In general, it's not confident for small applications. So if you have an application that's only using two or three VMs, or is not sending very much data in the network, Cicada probably isn't going to work as well. Though, to, you know, if you have a small application that's not really using the network, Cicada just really isn't meant for that application. Uh, the last point I want to make here is that Cicada can actually detect when a guarantee is too low um, and offer a new one. It can, it can do that by observing packet drops. Um, and since Cicada is continually collecting measurements, it can actually generate a prediction at any point in time. It's not the case that if it generates a bad prediction or a bad guarantee, the customer then has to wait an entire hour before that can be corrected. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is one other evaluation of Cicada, which I briefly touched on at the beginning, which is how it affects network utilization or wasted bandwidth in the network, okay? So wasted bandwidth would be bandwidth that is guaranteed for an application and then not used by it. And as a provider, of course, you'd wanna minimize this, right? Because you, you don't want a lot of waste in your network. Uh, and so when we started doing this evaluation, we realized that providers don't really treat all bandwidth the same. Interact bandwidth is usually cheap, whereas interact bandwidth can be more expensive. So really, the provider probably wants to minimize wasted interact bandwidth, okay? And what you should be thinking now is that, well, to do this evaluation, we need some sort of placement me mechanism to go along with the system, right? We need to actually offer guarantees and place the VMs before we can tell where that bandwidth will be used. And Cicada actually has a placement heuristic that comes along with it. It's a greedy heuristic. We just place the pairs of VMs that need the highest guarantee on the fastest paths. You can read more about this in the paper. It, it actually is pretty cool, it works quite well. Uh, and so what we're gonna look at on this graph is the interact bandwidth available as the oversubscription in the network varies. Okay, so we're gonna compare VOC and Cicada and see how they do. So VOC also has its own placement mechanism. 
Uh, and so here's just VOC. You can see as the oversubscription increases, the available interact bandwidth goes down, which is what you would expect, right? The network gets more constrained, available bandwidth decreases. So Cicada, it's a tiny bit better, but they're really quite comparable at this stage. But we have the sense that, you know, as cloud applications get kind of bigger and bigger, as they use more network bandwidth, there might start to be more of a separation between these two systems. Okay, so what we did is we took our applications and we started sort of multiplying them by different factors. So increasing the bandwidth that was sent between each pair. And so as we do that, you can see that as applications use more bandwidth, um, VOC's placement is, is kind of wasting more interact bandwidth than Cicada's, uh, particularly in these lower oversubscription factors, right, where Cicada is doing quite well. Okay, so just to sum up, what we've seen in this talk um, is that cloud applications exhibit variability uh, that existing models don't always capture. And Cicada is able to use this prediction method that does capture this variability. And in this talk, we use it to provide guarantees that are accurate, uh, that can be calculated quickly. I didn't get a lot of time to talk about this, but typically it only takes a few milliseconds to make a prediction for an application. Uh, they also don't require very much history and they do increase network utilization. So again, what I hope that I've convinced you of is that this type of prediction is possible and does some cool things for us. Again, not that this is the best prediction algorithm ever. Um, and if you enjoy this work, I would encourage you to look both at the paper and at a tech report that we published. And just because I think this is the only chance I might have to plug this, this was actually a large portion of my PhD thesis. So if you would like to read 135 single-spaced pages on such a system, please email me because I have written them for you. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Hi, uh, John Turkishchi from IBM Research. I have two questions. The first one is back to your initial question, the first question you asked. Do the VMs in these uh, infrastructures actually consume all these bandwidth. So based on your HP cloud data, can you actually tell if the VMs that are provisioned are utilizing, like I think the exa your example was based on 10 gig links. Are they able to actually saturate those links? So I'm not quite sure if I understand your question. So are they able to saturate like the links in the yep. data center? Oh, so I actually don't have data about the utilization on those links. We have the subsample data from the VMs. Um, we don't know how much of HP's network they were using at that time. Okay. Then I'll ask your opinion. Uh, okay. Let's say three resources, CPU, network, and memory. Do you think they will ever saturate network before memory and then CPU? I think for some applications, yes. I don't think for every cloud application. Okay. Uh, I think there are lots there are, of... So you, 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 have, you, you think some applications yes. will? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my second question then, um, uh, when you show your predictions, have you compared to a, say, last value predictor? Just assume the last hour is the predictor of the next hour. And so, how does it perform? So Cicadas is, um, performs better than that, although that's a really interesting question. Uh, if, so your question is just like, if we just use the previous traffic matrix yeah. and use that. Yeah, so what we actually looked at when we did this algorithm is, you know, you saw each matrix had a weight. Um, if you actually look what the weights turn out to be, the previous matrix is the most important one. So if you wanted just one matrix to do that, that's the one you want. But there is actually still fairly significant weights for about the first sort of last five yeah. hours. So Cicada will do better like, with that. Can, can you give me a data point like 1% better or 5% better, not, yours versus last value? Not off the top of my head, but I can send you one. Please, later. thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, great talk. It's Albert Greenberg, uh, Microsoft. Um, I was wondering about uh, how many um, jobs you have to take placement into account for. Uh, is it, uh, are there some, let's say elephant jobs in your workload that if you take care of them, you pretty much get most of the bang for the buck? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, I th in our workload, we didn't see a lot of that. Surely there are workloads where that is going to be the case. And then, yeah, you're right. If you have one dominating application, that's the one you, you would really want to look at. We were also thinking at the time, though, about you know customer applications are arriving. You, know, you don't know them all ahead of time. So it's sort of not clear then if you wanted to prioritize one, which one should you do? So, and uh, do you uh, 
migrate workload? Um, in this evaluation, we don't, but we have looked at that. Uh, we did a lot of experiments with the placement um, method on EC2, in fact, and there's, we actually have a whole other paper about that. Uh, and we found that for these applications, most of them benefit from just a good initial placement or being migrated once. They don't need to be migrated very frequently, but we haven't looked at that explicitly. Okay, thanks. Hmm? Hi, thanks for the talk. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a quick question. So in terms of guarantee, since uh, you have a time varying, uh, you know, traffic metrics. When you start, in fact, you do like, you know, scheduling ahead in the future, so you reserve for the entire duration of the application, or you just reserve for the next hour? I think you would probably reserve for the next hour. So effectively, you're not guaranteeing the performance, right? For, that, for that hour. Yeah, I but mean, for the, then, you know, for the next hour, for the hour after, basically, potentially, you, you may not be able to guarantee the performance. It's true. You, could try, you can use Cicada, though, to make as long-term guarantees as you want. For instance, so um, we this uh, these results are all for the next hour. Cicada could you know probably do a pretty good job on the next few hours. I wouldn't expect it to make an accurate prediction for like the next week, for instance. Um, but actually, like someone over here pointed out, uh, if you were concerned about sort of access control for the network, you can get a sense of what the you know the next hour will look at even before the previous will look like even before the previous hour will happen because um, I'm sorry I forget the person's name but they're correct that the previous matrix does have a large influence on what's happening next so you could do something with that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Blue Thunder Smoji with Cisco Systems. Um, curious how many ma previous matrices you used and were you seeing like daily or weekly patterns so, being influenced oh, by I'm so ready for this question. Uh, you, you can use as many as you want. We actually get very good results using just the past two days. Um, and we do see kind of diurnal ap um, variations a little bit. If you look at the graph of the weights, uh, though actually the, the previous traffic matrix is the most important and it slopes down, but then there is a spike um, at 24 hours for the applications in our data set. Uh, we also tested it on some, you know, some sort of simulated um, application, so, you know, the cool thing about this algorithm is that the weights aren't fixed, so that if you have an application that isn't diurnal, that's okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, Steve Muir, Comcast. This is great work. Um, there's been a lot of studies done on characterizing data center workloads, um, which is sort of somewhat related, um, and this is, I guess, kind of follow on to Albert's question. Did you consider how you might be able to use that type of data to characterize applications into ones that you can predict will be variable and ones that you can say, you know, with a degree of confidence, we know this is something that's just going to be constant, pretty much constant usage. Yeah, so we, we did that in some ways. Like what we found out with this prediction algorithm is, like I said, the smaller applications, it's just, it's generally we don't do a great job on. So we, we in some sense have this binary classification at the beginning, like, yeah, your application is too small, it's just probably not going to work. Um, but in terms of, doing like more after that. We, we didn't for this work. I think that would be really interesting. Um, but one of the reasons we didn't do it is because we kind of had this general model where so, you know, each application is kind of getting its own function. So in some sense, we would hope that that result kind of comes out of Cicada. But I can imagine, uh, you know, uh, one step beyond saying, okay, I recognize that this is application type A, this is type B, and I have a better way to predict right. things for A. Um, I think that would be really cool, but we haven't done that yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm.